Last time we followed the account of God healing a crippled man through Peter and John. When a crowd gathered there in the temple area to see what had happened, Peter challenged them strongly to recognize that, that Jesus, who they crucified, was the Messiah. The two former fishermen were arrested by the, the Supreme Council, and the next morning they were warned not to speak in Jesus' name again. Peter and John replied that they would have to obey God and keep telling people about what they'd been eyewitnesses to. More people in Jerusalem believed in Jesus through these events and were added to the church, which continued to strengthen and thrive. In the Acts account in chapter 5, Luke records two incidents that provide more insights into what God was doing at this point in history. How he was relating to the newly formed group that is Christ's body or Ecclesia on earth. In the first, Acts chapter 5, 1-11, Luke describes how God deals decisively with a couple attached to the Jerusalem church who act deceptively and try to make themselves appear more generous than they actually are. Although the results of sin among those claiming to be God's people today is rarely so dramatic and obvious as it was for the fledgling church, the account tells us a lot about the view God takes of anything that dishonors his name or corrupts his son's body on this earth. The second incident recorded in Acts chapter 5, 12-42, again sees Peter, and this time more of the apostles, imprisoned overnight by the Jewish authorities. The next morning, despite the apparently intact jail security, the officials are shocked to hear that the leaders of Jesus' followers are out in the temple area preaching. Luke records in Acts 5, 41-42, that after being threatened and flogged, the apostles are released, delighted to have had the privilege of suffering for the sake of their master. None of these events discourage them from obeying Jesus' command to bring new followers, disciples, to him. The text says that every day the apostles were teaching whoever would listen in open public forums and in individual homes. Without reaching for definite conclusions, it's worth noting in passing here that there's no mention of them trying to attract seekers to the, the meetings of the Ecclesia. From what we are told, the evangelism and teaching of anyone who's interested takes place outside the church gatherings. What Luke records next is also highly instructive and relevant to us as members of Jesus' body today, particularly as we try to obey his command to be witnesses and disciple makers for him in our local communities and out to the nations of the earth. We read this in Acts chapter 6, verse 1. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the, the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. Interestingly, we see that the group of early believers in Jerusalem is not as culturally or even linguistically homogenous as we might suppose. Certainly that they share a history of Jewish ethnicity and religion, but there are significant differences among them. On the whole, the Hebrew or Aramaic speaking majority is from a conservative Jewish background. The Greek speakers are, are generally more liberal, uh, having been influenced by Hellenization, the Greek and more recently Roman cultural dominance in the Mediterranean world. These differences now represent fault lines along which the first divisions can occur in the so far unified Ecclesia, something that sadly has happened countless times since, for one reason or another, down through history. The text says there are rumblings of discontent in the church. On the surface, the issue does not seem all that significant. The Greeks claim that their, their widows are not being cared for as well as the Hebrew women. But even relatively minor disputes can grow into serious problems if they're not handled right. What will happen? Jesus had said that one of the distinctives of his people would be their love for one another. The body, by definition, is meant to be unified. This is one of the reasons the Holy Spirit came, to join his new covenant people together as one. So how will the Spirit respond to this issue? God's interaction with his people has always involved him describing how things work within the reality he has created, the author explaining the narrative. His truth does not remain isolated in some mystical, spiritual realm. It works itself out in real life. It solves problems and provides practical frameworks within which we can fulfill his intentions. And, consistent with the pattern we have seen in God's dealings with humans from the beginning, he looks for opportunities to delegate real responsibility. This is entirely his choice as creator, his sovereign right. 
He graciously works with his faithful followers in genuine collaboration rather than pushing them aside to deal with things himself. This gets right down into the fundamental reasons for him creating an image brain race in the first place. Now these characteristics of God are playing themselves out in this new chapter of his narrative, the group of Jesus Christ's blood-bought people. Luke describes in, in Acts 6, 2-7, how the apostles led by the Spirit act decisively with a practical solution that, that serves God's purposes for the church. The apostles have been gifted by the Spirit and placed within the ecclesia specifically to serve it in certain ways. Their primary role is to feed the body with spiritual sustenance, to share the truth, God's narrative, with authority and clarity so that it leads God's children into genuine worship, produces change in their values and behavior as needed, and equips them to contribute to his purposes. As leaders, they don't feel they have to micromanage every aspect of the, the church's life. They're glad to follow God's pattern and what Jesus modeled for them by delegating responsibility to others. They decide that seven men should be chosen to take leadership in the practical areas of the church's function, like the distribution of food. This will keep the apostles free to focus on seeking God's guidance for themselves and for those in their care. But consistent with what they've seen from the Father and Son, these responsibilities will not just be handed out to anyone, nor will they be given on the basis of favoritism or social obligation. Whoever takes on these roles should be clearly submitting their lives to the Spirit's guidance and demonstrating wisdom in their dealings with others. The apostles don't act unilaterally or dictatorially, but instead put their plan before the group, recorded in Acts chapter 6, verses 2-4. to four. The idea is supported and significantly it is the church body that chooses men among them who, who they feel are suitable, no doubt those who are already demonstrating an enthusiasm to serve along with the organizational skills. The names of the seven men chosen listed in Acts chapter 6 verse 5 suggest they were Hellenists, those with Greek cultural and language backgrounds, but this isn't certain because Palestinian Jews often had Greek names as well. In front of the group, these men are recognized by the apostles as those who will take the lead in areas of service, a concept linked back to the practical roles of priests under the Old Covenant as they served God's people. In Greek, the term used is diakonia, service, and diakonos, servant, which of course has come into our English language as deacon. And so a pattern was established with God's guidance at the outset, Two distinct but related ways to lead and serve the church, as elders, which the apostles filled for the Jerusalem church, or as deacons. What is described next in the Acts account, in Acts chapter 6 verse 8 through to chapter 7 verse 60, will have incredibly far-reaching results for the young church and for how it takes the next steps given to it by the master. The narrative focuses on one of the newly appointed servant leaders or deacons in the Jerusalem church. Stephen is someone who is obviously experiencing God's grace himself and is able to help others see it as well. Also, the Spirit has given him a prominent role in demonstrating God's involvement in this new movement in Jerusalem, performing amazing miracles and signs among the people. Trouble occurs when some antagonistic Hellenistic Jews realize they've come off second best in a theological debate with Stephen, recorded for us in, in Acts chapter 6 verses 9 to 10. What they don't know, of course, is that he has the advantage of the wisdom that comes from his constant companion, God's Spirit. In a move very reminiscent of what happened to Jesus, these Jews persuade some others to accuse Stephen of blasphemy. The charges sound strikingly similar to what his master was wrongly accused of. Selective fragments of the message are repeated out of context of God's one narrative, twisted and misapplied, they're made to sound heretical. The enemies of Jesus and his followers finally have what they've been waiting for, grounds on which to attack the movement that threatens their hold on the people. Stephen is arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Council. The false charges are led. How does he plead? Will he admit or deny the accusations? With his face glowing, Stephen launches into a summary of the history of Abraham's descendants and their relationship with God. His words are recorded for us in Acts chapter 6 verse 15 through chapter 7 verse 53. 
The conclusions he draws from this synopsis of the Old Covenant narrative are anything but diplomatic. He clearly has no intention of ingratiating himself or avoiding any harsh treatment. So we read in Acts chapter 7, verses 51 to 53, You stubborn people, you are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. Name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah whom you betrayed and murdered. You deliberately disobeyed God's law, even though you received it from the hands of angels. They're stubborn, he says, deaf and disobedient to the truth, resisting the efforts of God's spirit to enlighten them, just like their ancestors so often did. They are no more God's people than the heathen Gentile people groups. They've persecuted and killed God's prophets, even killing the Messiah himself. The Jewish leaders' supporters are beside themselves with rage. They hiss and jeer. But Stephen is no longer concerned with them. As Acts chapter 7 verses 55 and 56 record, he's absorbed by something infinitely more compelling and wonderful. God's Spirit is allowing him to see beyond the boundaries of this limited world of the senses to where God exists in all his glory. And look, there's his beloved master, Jesus, standing next to his Father in a place where he's fully honoured and acclaimed. Why can't the crowd see what is so real to him? Surely they see the, the Father and the Son there? But no, there's no one so blind as those who won't see, or as deaf as those who refuse to hear. They cover their ears and shout or drown out what they're convinced is blasphemy. They want to make him stop, to revenge his accusations that have found their mark and cut so deep. They, they surge forward, grab him, drag him down the narrow streets, more and more people tailing along to see what is happening, then out one of the gates to an open waste area. He must be killed by ritual stoning. The heretic is to die outside the city walls, rejected by his people, just like his master before him. The ringleaders get organized. Come on, everyone, collect stones. Here, young Saul, look after our cloaks. We need our arms free for this. The brutal execution starts. First one, then another, then more and more stones find their mark. Stephen, now on his knees, looks up. Lord Jesus, I'm coming. You're ready for me, aren't you? Don't blame them for this. Then mercifully, he's gone. The first of many in the church who'll give their lives for the sake of Jesus and his great purpose of rescuing a lost and rebellious race.